Thank you. And it is good to have all of you here. Thanks so much for joining today. I'm looking forward to sharing with you some of the things that we've learned about navigating digital learning. And I expect that many of you have had either greater or lesser experiences with digital learning in the past couple of years as the, um, the COVID pandemic has really thrown us into digital learning, whether we were ready or not. Uh, I've actually been working in the field for more than a decade and uh, have over that time sought to really, really learn some lessons that I hope I can share with you today. One of my roles as chief learning officer is to bring what we know from education research and learning science research into the creation of what we make. And so my background is actually in educational psychology. So you'll see throughout the presentation that I bring a lot of that research into the informing us and thinking about how we can build digital tools, how we can use digital tools with learners uh, to really help improve learning outcomes, which of course is our ultimate goal here. So with that, let me jump in and, and, and review a little bit about what I'm gonna talk about through the course of the, my talk today. I'm gonna go for about 40 minutes, just kind of talking and sharing some of my thoughts, and then we'll open it up for Q&A for about 20 minutes. If you have questions during the, while, I, while I'm talking and during my presentation, please add those to the Q&A session and I'll use that as uh, the, the feed for the, the Q&A after I, I'm finished with my piece. So there, I think there's three big things that are important at, to talk about in terms of digital learning. The first is motivation. How do we keep learners engaged in digital environments? So we're gonna talk more about that. Second, self-regulated learning. That's a little bit of a education jargon, but basically it's how do we help learners become the owners of their own learning? What does that look like? And then third, assessment. How do we understand what learners know and can do, particularly in digital environments? And what does that look like? So I'm gonna cover each of those three things today. I'm gonna to share, like I said, some of what I've learned from years of working in digital learning environments and also uh, what the research says and how we can bring those together to help learners improve their outcomes. So let's start with motivation. I heard a lot over the past two years as learners more and more were going online and, and participating in online courses that it's really difficult to stay motivated and to keep working towards things, particularly when you're working online, it seems like sometimes you're kind of by yourself. And so there's a key theory in motivation research that is pretty simple, actually. Again, we put some fancy words around it, but it's called expectancy value theory. But what it really says is there's two main things that keep us motivated. One, having some expectation that we'll be successful at the thing we're going to do. And second, valuing that thing. So if we take that in terms of online or digital learning, you're more likely to be motivated when you think you're likely to be successful, which makes sense. Who wants to do things when they think they're gonna fail at them? Um, and second, when there's some value to that thing you're learning, when you see the value of that. So those two pieces together, provide a framework that we can use to think about what are the things we can do to help learners stay motivated. And so when we think about that expectancy of success, there's some different pieces of that. We can think about your expectancy on a particular task. So how much do I think I'm likely to be successful in math tasks, for example? You can think about expectation of success in a particular context, for instance, how good am I or how ready am I to do university level work? It's another thing that students can think can, can frame their expectation of success about. And also given particular backgrounds. So thinking about um, students who come from different demographic communities, different groups will have different expectations of success and what that looks like. So all of those things can play a role in terms of expectation of success. And second, and our second value also has multiple components. So there's intrinsic values such as find, you just find this, this material interesting and enjoyable or this, this activity interesting and enjoyable. 
There are rewards that are obtained from engagement. That's another way to increase something's value is to increase the, the reward given. There's relevance. So thinking about, again, I value this because it will help me achieve, for instance, my career goals that I'm looking for. And then there's social value. So if all of your peers are doing something or this activity helps you interact more with uh, people you value or people you value value this activity, all of that also increases that value, which increases motivation to do things. So if we think about all of those pieces, what are some clear things we can do to help students stay motivated and help learners stay motivated? So first, specific things we can do to increase that feelings of likelihood of success. We can think about first setting goals and monitoring progress because nothing increases your feeling that I can be successful like having had some success at this in the past. So if we set short-term goals, we're talking a week at the longest in terms of what that goal might be. This is the, the help learners think about what do I want to achieve this week? What is the thing I need to get done this week? And then help monitor progress towards that. So being able to see if I need to read, even if it's as simple as a reading goal, I need to read these two chapters this week. Okay, what does that look like for each day? And how do I monitor my progress of doing that? But it could also be at Khan Academy, we have, for example, um, skill mastery. So if we might want to master two of the skills in your calculus course this week. So you can, again, set that as your weekly goal as opposed to over this whole course, this is all the things we wanna do. Break that up into what do I wanna do this week? And then monitor your progress for us at Khan Academy, that involves moving through stages of familiar to proficient to mastered on different skills that you earn by practicing and continuing. But making that explicit is really important. And so looking at digital tools, many digital tools help students have some of those cues that help them monitor progress. But it's also important as educators that we help students think about what is your goal for this week? And how, what are the things that you can look at to make sure you're getting close to that goal? So that's the first thing. Second, celebrate success and reflect. So there's two pieces here. So one, when students are successful, you wanna celebrate that success. So at the end of that week, they did work and uh, get master those two new skills. It's important to celebrate that because remember the thing we're doing is trying to increase their feelings that they are likely to be successful. So if they're successful this week, when they start next week, they're feeling like, hey, I was successful last week. I can do that this week. So again, building up those feelings. So there's that piece of it. And so celebrate success, but also reflect. And reflect is whether they're successful or not. It's important to ask some questions like, what were the things you did that helped you achieve this goal? Or if they didn't achieve the goal, what were the roadblocks that got in your way that made it so you couldn't achieve this goal? And we can think about then how to problem solve around those roadblocks. And even if they were successful, we can ask, how did you get around roadblocks? Were there things that made it hard to get to the goal this week? And how did you get to the goal anyway? What were those things? Because that reflection is really important for that next step which is if students feel like there's big blockers that are gonna prevent them from being successful, it's hard to be motivated to start. So one important thing we can do is help to prepare students to think about what's gonna happen if they get stuck. So if you have students that are working on a homework problem and they get stuck, I have, as, as students at uh, Khan Academy, we're working on Khan Academy from a distance, not in classrooms over the past couple of years. We actually suggested you could make, just write out, out for learners. Uh, learners could write out for themselves, what are three things I'm gonna do if I get stuck? So on our platform, for example, the first thing you might do is watch one of the videos that often show examples or look for hints in the problem um, and think about how you might solve hints. So that could be a couple of things you're gonna do if you're stuck, but call it out, write down, these are the things you're gonna do. So it's a list that you can actually check off when you get stuck. 
Because again, we're trying to think about how do we help students feel like they can be successful? So second, th next thing, think about are that do they have any peers or friends they could call or reach out to or reach out for help to? Can they reach out to their teacher, professor? Is that the maybe third or fourth thing on the list of how to get help? So all of those things in the list, you wanna provide multiple strategies for students when they get stuck. So they know, hey, if I get stuck, that's okay. I have ways to get unstuck and still be successful. So again, thinking proactively, how do we help keep students working? How do we help keep them motivated? And the fourth thing is to emphasize that effort does lead to success. So there's a lot of research. Um, Carol Dweck pioneered this work around growth mindset. And the idea that your brain is like a muscle and the more you work it hard, the stronger it will be. In the same way that if you lift the two pound weights, you're not gonna gain that much muscle. But if you keep challenging yourself to go a little harder, a little heavier, you'll build that, that muscle in your arm or whatever weight you're lifting. The same way in your brain, if you just work on the easy problems, you're not building those connections, those neurons in your brain aren't connecting to each other. But if you keep working on those harder things that you are just at the edge of what you're comfortable doing, that's what's gonna help create that, those stronger connections for you and help you learn more. So again, treating initial failure as that's okay. We're gonna keep working on this and keep practicing and you will get better. Um, it's an important thing for students to learn. It's actually, um, there's resources out there in terms of growth mindset that actually talk about the biological basis of your neurons um, and how the connections between neurons form and that helps us learn and what are the things that help do that. So all of those kinds of pieces, talking to students explicitly about how practice actually helps you learn over time um, can be important motivators to help students understand that it's okay to struggle and it's okay to fail on your first attempts, um, and, but that's okay and leads us actually to greater success later. So all of those things are things we can do to help students increase their likelihood to success. So remember, that's the first thing that helps students stay motivated. The second is thinking about how do we enhance value? So thinking about how, for, the first way to do this, we all wish, I think, that, that learners just loved the topic we're teaching. And so sometimes we can do things to enhance students' just curiosity and wonder about the world. And part of that is modeling it yourself. Like, isn't this amazing that this is how this works? Um, so you can think about whether that's a, a, you know, something in biology that, isn't it amazing that our bodies work this way and the system developed this way? And just starting to think about that kind of wonder of the world. And the other thing is to spark curiosity. So thinking about starting out by asking questions that are a little bit like makes, that seem counterintuitive or observations that, that raise students' curiosity because they think, how could that be? How did that work like that? So things that don't seem to fit into what we would expect um, and the results of where those are can all trigger that curiosity and wonder. And that's a really nice way to kind of just raise the value of what you're teaching because it, again, starts the value of the activity becomes answering this interesting question about how the world works. That's not always gonna be the case, um, but it's a good thing to, to start thinking about ways that you can um, start thinking about those counterintuitive examples or those interesting questions that um, you know might lead to one, hey, do you know your cat's DNA shares whatever percent uh, of, of genes with human DNA? Um, or you know, thinking about just interesting facts and things you can bring up that spark that curiosity and wonder. Second is that idea of establishing relevance. So there's a, a number of ways that we can establish relevance. Students can see relevance based on how this fits into their daily life now. They can see relevance in terms of how it's gonna lead to career goals that they have. They can see relevance in terms of how it's going to lead to something else that they're interested in learning. Um, now, this isn't always the case. And I know as a teacher, sometimes it's hard when students say, when am I ever gonna need to know this? And, um, sometimes it's, there's not a, a clear answer for everything, 
Um, and so in those cases, sometimes it's better to use some of the other strategies, but when it's possible to make those links, to make things relevant, that clearly increases the value of an activity for a learner. And third, okay, think about rewards. Now, sometimes I hear people say, oh, I don't wanna reward my, my students, my child, because they should just love learning. That's probably not realistic. There's probably things in all of our lives that we could use some rewards for to get us at least initially started on a topic or get, get us to do something we don't really wanna do. I know even sometimes when I'm writing, which I like generally writing, you know, articles and papers, um, sometimes it's still, I just need a little, I say, if I just finish this page, I will give myself a little piece of chocolate. Um, because sometimes it's rough, even when it's something you like to do. So the key with using rewards that we've seen from research is that there is some danger if you are intrinsically motivated to do something. So I was always a reader growing up, loved to read books, read a lot. If you start giving someone extrinsic rewards for that, so start giving them, hey, every three books you read, you get a certificate for free ice cream, et cetera. Um, that starts, people can start to then attribute why they read to that external factor instead of the internal factor. And so that then means like, oh, now if the external factor goes away, I'm not gonna do that anymore. So that's what you wanna guard against. So how do you do that? So first, if you make rewards unexpected and at different variability, that means they become less expected. So if it's not something that a learner knows, if I do this every three times, I'm gonna get this specific reward. If instead it's more random, um, and if it's something that they're, they're not expecting to do, that then decreases the likelihood that they're gonna lose some of that intrinsic motivation. Rewards are also good for things that students aren't intrinsically motivated to do. So when you think about stu getting students started on something, getting them kind of just enough experience to be interested in it, just getting them going, that can be a good place to use rewards too. So, and, and the third thought is rewards don't have to be monetary. They can be things like make, having choice, making selections. Um, if you do this, so when I, mean, I talk to parents, I often say things like it can be picking the game you're gonna play that night, picking the movie you're gonna watch, um, choosing dinner, um, spending just time with, with parents. Uh, for um, folks that are teachers and educators, thinking about things, again, like offering choice. Hey, if you do this, we get to this assignment, you can choose A or B to do this assignment. Um, you can think about other ways that you have to um, offer students some things that are valuable to them to help them increase the value of the activity that you're doing. So that's a, a um, thinking about using rewards. Rewards are not necessarily a bad thing. We just wanna use them judiciously and wisely. So there's some thoughts about motivation and things as we think about moving and keeping learners motivated generally, but also specifically we know in digital learning spaces, it can be um, difficult to do that. So the next piece I wanna talk about is student agency. Because I think we all agree that ultimately we want our, our students to be lifelong learners. We want them to love learning. And that often means they need to be able to take ownership of their own learning. They need to become owners of what they're doing. And so we know from the research again that students, uh, that, that digital learning shifts a lot of responsibility to students. So particularly we saw this um, when we were doing distance learning and hybrid learning over the past couple of years, students really became much more responsible for their own, their own choices, their own progress. And many honestly weren't ready for that. <laughs> um, and we ran into some difficulties. So how do we think about helping learners gather the skills they need to be able to learn on their own and take responsibility for their learning? So that's the big, the big question that we want to think about. And so the, the research on self-regulated learning breaks it into three components. So first, there's this idea, metacognition. So metacognition is thinking about your own thinking. So that means taking a step back from the thing you're learning and doing that planning, that goal setting we talked about, organizing, and asking yourself, am I on track? Am I not on track? How do I get back on track? 
all of that, that piece I was talking about earlier in terms of um, how to help unblock and making a list of ways to get help, one of the first things you need to do is recognize you need help. <laughs> and then thinking about how to get help and what that is, that's all actually a metacognitive skill that's saying, oh, I am stuck here. Okay, what do I need to do to get unstuck? And how do I do those things? So all of that, thinking about your thinking, thinking about your learning, those are skills that can be taught. Um, and we expect often students to just know them and to have them. But that's actually not the case for many students. So I'll talk more about teaching them and these skills in a moment. So that's thinking about your own thinking. Second is actually giving students the cognitive strategies, the learning strategies to help be successful. So I know, for instance, in university, lots of students have their textbook or their ebook, and they just, how do they study is they keep reading and rereading, they highlight passages, they go back and read the highlighted passages. Well, it turns out that's not as effective as actually closing the book and quizzing yourself. Because what you're doing when you quiz yourself is the same thing you need to do on a test. You're practicing retrieving information from your long-term memory and bringing it back into your working memory to be used. And when you're just reading and rereading highlighted sections, all you're doing, you're not practicing retrieving, you're just continuing to try to put the information into your long-term memory, <laughs> but you're not practicing getting it back out. So those kind of skills where you say, hey, instead of rereading and rereading, close your book and quiz yourself, that's a good learning strategy. But students are never taught these, and so they don't know. So again, I'm going to give you some resources about learning strategies. And then third, we come back to motivation, which we've talked about a little bit, so I'm not going to talk about as much here. But the other piece about regulating, being a self-regulated learner is believing that you have the, the ability to achieve your goals. And so that comes from some of the things we were talking about before too, believing that you can be successful. So those are three big pieces. And now that I said, there's this question of, well, can you actually teach these skills? And so what uh, this graphic here is, is a, um, a summary of research from a meta-analysis. So they took all the studies about uh, teaching self-regulation and combined them in statistically combined them and looked at what is the effect of teaching meta now uh, teaching these self-regulated learning skills. So first they found that self-regulated learning is related to better learning outcomes and that self-regulated learning can be taught and that those who receive instruction use the skills more and achieve better outcomes. So if you're familiar with box plots we have on the right here, um, they actually even looked at even primary school students. So even students who are in younger, younger ages can learn these skills. And then these uh, secondary school students. So I know a number of folks here are from post-secondary, but we see the same thing that you can teach these skills to students. And so when you look at the effect size, that middle bar on each box is the median, the middle effect size across all the studies that did this work. And we can look at the effect of teaching self-regulated learning skills and that effect on academic performance, that effect on their strategy use, so how much students use them, and their effect on motivation. And so what you see here is that uh, zero basically means the group that got taught the skills and the group that didn't get taught the skills had the same outcome. So that would be what a zero means. It has, so a zero for academic performance would mean the teaching the, the metacognitive skills had no impact on students' academic outcomes. Instead, what we see is that across each of these outcomes, both primary school and secondary school students had significant improvement in their, in their outcomes and their use of these strategies. So again, compared students who got taught strategies with students who didn't, students who did had better learning outcomes and they used those skills more. So we can do it. We can teach these skills to learners and it will help them have better outcomes. So what does that look like? So when we start teaching about metacognition, we need to teach, help students do two things. One is making accurate self-appraisals. So you may know we're actually not that good at reflecting on our own knowledge states, reflecting on what we know. 
because often we don't know what we don't know. And so you'll see novices, folks that are just starting to learn something, think that they know a lot about that thing uh, because they have no idea what else is to be learned. So we need to help students become better at understanding their own abilities. And then we need to help them form plans, monitor results, and do all of those things we were talking about. So how does that work? So first, it turns out that it's not great to just teach these skills in isolation. It actually is better for those of you teaching in domains, so teaching math, teaching science, teaching history, to teach these skills along with your domain content because it creates that connectivity, it creates a reason, it creates also opportunities for them to practice doing these skills as they're actually learning. So the next piece is actually explicitly teaching these skills. So talk to students, hey, we're gonna talk today about the idea of retrieval practice. And hey, I know that's outside of our usual, we talk, you know, this is our calculus course. But I'm going to spend five minutes talking about this idea of why this is a good way to study. Or we're going to talk for five minutes today about goal setting. And we're going to think about what our goal is for this week in class and what that's going to look like. So talk to them about the usefulness of these strategies. This is why we're going to talk about goal setting today. This is why we're going to talk about retrieval practice today. And to convince them it's worth that initially this is going to be a little more effort. It's going to take them a, another, it's another step where they're thinking about doing something they're not used to doing. But over time, it becomes a habit and becomes something that becomes much more ingrained. So you can think over the course of a semester, thinking about establishing this as something that happens every week. You talk about a metacognitive strategy or a cognitive strategy, and you think about having them practice it for that week having them reflect on how that worked and maintain that over time. So those are the kind of the important pieces of thinking about how to do this. I do wanna point you, I have no affiliation with this group, um, learningscientists.org. When we talk about those cognitive strategies, that retrieval practice I talked about, the idea of spaced practice, that it's better to study over time than try to cram everything in the night before the test. Um, all of these things that learning science has taught us are really good study practices, those cognitive strategies. They have, for six of them, excellent downloadable tools that there's presentations that you could use to talk about why you use them. There's little posters and things that students can print out to remind them of them. Uh, there's lots of different tools um, here. Again, I have no affiliation with them. I'm just a fan. <laughs> but if you're interested in teaching these skills and you're not sure what these skills are, this is a great resource for you to use to think about um, how you can help teach these skills. So that's self-regulated learning. The big takeaway here is we kind of expect students at university, we think they're going to come in with these skills. And when they don't, sometimes we think, well, how can students not have these skills? no one has ever taught them. <laughs> we just kind of expect it. And some students pick them up on the way, kind of pick them up through trial and error, but it, a lot of students don't, and we can help them get these skills. And we can do it best actually when we do that in an integrated way with their courses. Finally, assessment. So as we think about digital learning, there are a lot of questions that come up in terms of how do we know what students know? And so when we start thinking about assessment, first, I think it's important to talk about what, what are the outcomes we want from an assessment. And in the assessment world, we talk about formative assessment and summative assessment. And in formative assessment, we talk a lot about how we um, are assessing for information to inform our instruction. And so that can be to inform students about hey, you've almost got this, but you don't have this yet, keep working on this. It can be to inform educators, teachers, about what their class needs some extra work on, what they should do next, what maybe they, how they should group students for a lesson. All of those things can be formative assessment. And then summative assessment is, okay, we're at the end of your learning journey, what do you know? What have you gotten to and how, where have you, what have you achieved? So think about, when you're thinking about assessment, first of all, think about, is this a formative assessment? Is this something that I'm trying to do to help inform learning? Or is this something that I'm doing to try to evaluate and judge what's been learned? 
Um, so those are important pieces there. And then as you think about those different assessments, think about, is this something I need to gather in a short set period of time? So is this something that I should, you know, I need to say, I wanna see what you can do in this 45 minute block of time, show me what you know, or is it something that maybe you could gather evidence about over time? And I'll get into a little bit more of that in a minute. And the, the final thing is ultimately our goal for learning is that we want our learners to be able to apply the information that they are learning in your class to new situations, to real world problems, to being able to solve things in the, in, out after the class is over. So how might we think about assessment differently if we think about trying to assess their ability to do that as opposed to their ability to just answer questions about the content? So digital learning and digital tools can change how we think about assessment. And I'm gonna challenge you to think a little bit differently because learners are doing all sorts of activities digitally now, which means we can gather that information as they're learning. So as opposed to having all the learning taking place and then say, wait, stop, you need to take a test. Could we think about being able to gather information about learners as they're learning so that we don't need to keep doing, especially a lot of that formative assessment, but we can use the information from their learning activity to understand who needs a little more help, who's doing really well and might partner with someone who needs a little more help. What, do, what does the whole class need to review overall? We could get all of that information and maybe even make better decisions if we're able to use more of that digital data that's available to us from online learning tools. So one of the other pieces about digital tools is they can help us create those more authentic and maybe engaging activities. So this, again, I have no affiliation with this, this is the FET simulation. The FET simulations are out of the University of Colorado and our science uh, simulations. And this is certainly looks different than a multiple choice test about energy, friction, and gravity, right? <laughs> um, but you can set up problems, ask students to answer problems, solve problems in this interface with this simulation that looks much more like the kinds of things that we would want students to be able to do and things that they actually want to do. Like this is, so this is set up to be about designing a skate park. Um, and you can think about the, the angles and the energy that's used as students are and different configurations of a half pipe, for example. So again, thinking about how this is related to more authentic tasks and more engaging tasks for learners. And on the right, you see there is very different kinds of data that we can gather from students interacting. So look at all the places in that, that scenario that they can interact with the, the environment, that digital environment. So they can um, indicate what kind of things they wanna track up at the top right. They can change the friction with that slider. They can change the gravity and they can change the mass. They can even change what planet they're on. You can see there's an earth drop down there. They could pick a different planet. Um, and then you have on the left, kinetic potential thermal and total energy. So you can imagine Students can run experiments here. You can then gather the information about how they run the experiment. So from trial one to trial two, did they change one variable so they know the impact of that variable? Or did they change multiple variables so they're not gonna be able to tell which variable caused the change in the outcome? So again, you can start thinking about science practices and how students actually design experiments as opposed to asking them a multiple choice question about how to design an experiment or ask them to write an essay about designing an experiment, you can see them conduct an experiment. Um, so all of those things help us get to more authentic assessment experiences that we can think about using in the digital world and not have to worry so much about creating a multiple choice questions that students are answering and all of the worries about security and proctoring and all of those things about assessment. Instead, be thinking about how do you create um, activities like this that are much more difficult for students to be able to just kind of click an answer and get through, but really require them to engage and think about what they're doing and provide much more information than just right or wrong. 
actually can provide you with the steps that students took to be able to solve the problem that you laid out for them. So all of this requires some new ways of thinking. So in the, in the past, we have what I would call an item paradigm. A, a, a an assessment is a test that is made of items and you think about what those items do. But in a digital learning space, we can think about activity and think about asking students to engage in activity as a form of assessment. And what that does is really change how we think in a lot of ways. So if we think about the problem, items really just pose a question, whereas activities are really there to request an action. They're requesting students to do something. In terms of output, items have answers. Activities have features. So I talked about this idea of you could look at, for instance, the steps a student took. You can look at the outcome of the activity. Did that skater in the skate park, were they able to make it up the, the ramp of the half pipe? But they also have things like, how long did the student take to do this? What order did they do things in? Did they control their variables in the experiment? All of those pieces. Next, we can talk about interpretation. So items have correctness. They're basically right or wrong. But activities have attributes. So it can be, for instance, shorter or longer time that you took to answer the question. Again, it could be sequence. It could be many things other than just right and wrong. And that gives us much more information about what the students are doing. And uh, that last piece, items often provide very focused information. So we often actually, in the assessment world, try to write items that only get at one skill. And activities are often able to get at many skills together, and we can start to see how students actually incorporate a number of skills to solve a problem, which is something that in the real world, it's very seldom that we have a problem that only requires us to have one skill that we're using. So that's an important thing to think about and to change a bit of our thinking about how we think about assessment. It doesn't just have to be a test that looks like a test we used to give on paper and pencil, but it could, we could think about how the digital world lets us do different things that lets us think about the world in a different way. And that really is our challenge with technology, not to recreate our existing world with new technology, but to reimagine our world, to take advantage of this digital first world. And that I think is a place where, particularly in the world of assessment, we have some big steps that we could take to think differently about how we understand what students know and can do. So I'm gonna stop there, thank you. It's been a really, uh, I've enjoyed sharing all of this with you.